The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Unew Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Let's Talk Careers with Sarah on Armed Radio Global. And you'll probably hear me on iHeartRadio and also on speakers.com. So you can also have these recordings on my page, Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. I want to discuss today about the secrets, power of salary negotiating. So I get these ideas a lot from Roger Dawson. He has a book about uh, salary negotiating skills. So I want to discuss about things that everybody wants to know, how to get more money from your employer. And if you are an employee and you are looking for um, knowing ways to get all kinds of salary negotiating skills and you are listening to my show to learn some tricks to get your employer to pay you more than you are worth you're going to be a mite disappoint disappointed and yes I'll teach you how to gain power in a negotiation and I'll teach you some negotiating techniques that you will get your employer or potential employer to pay you what you are worth but I do not intend to tell you how you can get your employer to pay you more than you are worth. That, after all, would disrupt the sense, the fabric of capitalism as we know it. If you are an employer who who bought the idea about not giving this um, salary, like salary raises, then um, you're and you're hoping to learn how to keep your employees slaving away at the margin equivalent of a salt mine for less than they are worth. You too are going to be disappointed. What I believe is that many employees are working for far less than they are worth simply because they don't know how to negotiate a salary, and many employers could get far more from their employees. If they knew how to negotiate compensation packages that would stimulate their employees to produce more. More than any other negotiation, a salary negotiation must be win-win. Both sides must be genuinely happy with the result. Anything less and the arrangement will fall apart one day and both sides will be unhappy. A good salary negotiation should stimulate the employee to do his or her best while making huge profits for his or her employer. That's what I will teach you tonight. What I am going to teach you about getting the offer and you will learn how to write a resume that will get you an interview, write the job openings, interview well for the job, get the employer to put an offer on on the table, and learn how to respond to the offer using closing tactics to get decision from the employer. And then if we have time, if not, then next week, I'm going to teach you about negotiating compensation. And what you will learn is how to prepare for the negotiation, how to use pressure points to improve the offer, and how to use power negotiating gambits to get a compensation package. If you already have a job offer, or if you are negotiating an increase in your present job, you can cut to the chase and go right to uh, knowing the rest of the negotiating skills. If you are looking for work or thinking about making a move, you should then wait till the end of the show. And I promise you, by the time you f- you are going to finish listening to my show, you will have everything you will ever need to get a great pay raise from your present employer to nego- or negotiate a dynamic compensation package from a new employer. 
Now I am I've been preaching for years, but you cannot that you cannot make money faster than you can when you're negotiating. When you are negotiating, figure out how long it took you to get a concession, and then multiply that out of a per hour earning basis. Let's say that you spend an extra five minutes negotiating, and you save yourself only a hundred dollars. You spend five minutes to make a hundred dollars, which means that you were making money at the rate of a thousand two hundred per hour, a thousand two hundred dollars per hour while you were negotiating. That's more than two point three million dollars a year if you only worked forty hours a week and took four week vacation. <clears throat> That's pretty good money. You cannot make money faster than you can when you are negotiating. A member of、um, Roger Dawson's golf club was once listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's highest-paid heart surgeon. But even he would tell you that he makes more money per hour than he is negotiating a business deal. This is even more true when you are negotiating an increase in pay. And here is why: there isn't a person in this country who couldn't walk into his or her boss's office and negotiate a ten dollars a week increase in pay. But that doesn't sound like very much, does it? However, ten dollars a week is five hundred twenty dollars a year. If you are with a company for another five years, that's two thousand six hundred dollars. You just negotiated an increased compensation, and it probably only took you fifteen minutes to do it. Two thousand six hundred dollars in fifteen minutes. That means you were earning money at the rate of ten thousand dollars four hundred per hour while you were negotiating that tiny increase in pay. Do you realize that to be earning that kind of money, you would have to be making nearly twenty million dollars a year? There are only a handful of people in the world who are making that kind of money, negotiating an increase in pay with your boss. Really, is the highest and best use of your time. It's well worth taking some time to plan, to study, and to do it right. And that's what I will teach you tonight. Stage one of a salary negotiation is submitting a resume to the potential employer. Be very clear in your mind that the purpose of the resume is to get an interview. You cannot sell yourself to the employer. With a resume, you cannot get the employer to make you an offer with a resume. The only thing a resume is good for is to get you to the next stage of the salary negotiation, which is the face-to-face -face interview. Millions of resumes are submitted every day in this country, sent by mail, faxed, email. Where do they all go? Which ones does the employer offer even read? If an employer advertises a job. Five hundred to two thousand resumes might be submitted. How can you make yours mean something? So I am going to explain to you tonight that how to prepare your resume and how to get it read. Things to exclude from your resume. Let's start with that. If you haven't applied for a job for a long while, you may not be aware that anything that could be considered. Discriminatory is a no-no in today's politically correct world. Employers are not allowed to ask your age, sex, marital status, religion, height, weight, or whether you smoke, and you are not to offer that information. The person who reviews your resume will immediately exclude you if you do. For one thing, it shows that you are hopelessly out of touch, and for another, it smells of an attorney trolling. For a discrimination lawsuit, let's learn how to increase your chances of getting your resume read. The key issue is to make it relevant to the job for which you are applying. It's better to send ten resumes that are tailored to the job than a hundred resumes broadsided in the hope that one of them will attract attention. Remember that the HR director may be reviewing fifty or sixty resumes a day, perhaps more if the company accepts email resumes. They are looking for ways to eliminate applicants, and at that stage, lack of rele relevant background will get you kicked out. If you have tailored your resume to the job opening, the initial response may well be, "This could be just the person we are looking for. Let's get this one in an interview." And 
Consider the way that editors train their journalists to write stories, an attention-grabbing headline to make the reader want to read it, and a concise and interesting first paragraph that clearly states that the story is about. From then on, the story grows and expands with detail. You don't have to read it all to understand what is it about. But if the article continues to hold the reader's interest, they will read it to the end. Use the same formula when you are writing your resume. Your resume should scream, I can solve your problems for you. Use an attention-grabbing headline that is directly relevant to the job opening. Include a well-written description of your experience, starting with your most recent position and work back in time. Don't let anyone tell you that a long resume is a mistake. A long resume is only a mistake if it's boring. If it continues to grab the interviewer's attention, it can be several pages long. But preferable not. Okay, A long resume is fine as long as the employer can pick it up and quickly see what he or she needs to know about the applicant. Long resumes are a big mistake when the employer tries to get to the crux of the applicant's qualifications, but can't. Some people write resumes with such gravitas that they think the employer will be so excited to get their resume that they will clear their desk to concentrate on reading it and then call a hiring committee meeting to consider it. A more realistic approach would be think of an employer groaning as he or she plows through the stack of 200 resumes. Your first challenge is to have your resume grab his or her attention. I, as a resume writer, I do a lot of standing out from the crowd resumes. And really, somebody already told me that I write a million dollar resume, hashtag million dollar resume. And this is exactly what the hiring manager wants to see. They want to see something different than the rest of, than, than just black and white. I don't do it colorful, but I do add some layouts to make it still black and white but with layout now um, if you do need somebody to do that for you you can reach out to me on Facebook let's talk careers with Sarah and uh, message me there and I'll help you out now should you call the employer after sending the resume that's a question I always been asked only if you want to get hired call three days after sending the resume don't call to ask if they got it. That's lame. And if they have a stack of 200 resumes on their desk, they probably won't know anyway. Remember that the purpose of your call is to get the next level, which is the first interview. They are not going to hire you from a phone call, so don't even try to get hired. Focus on getting the interview. Use a lively, I can solve your problems approach. If you need someone to open up that territory in Alaska, I'm the perfect person for you. That's exactly what I did for my last company, and sales were 320% over budget. When can we get together? Would Wednesday or Thursday be better for you? If you can't get an interview with this call, tell them that you will call again in three days, and be sure that you do it. Use good judgment on this. Um, if you think it will help, include a picture, but advisable not, depending on what job you're doing and if you have any reasons to think it would be negative leave it out be sure that the picture is business like no cheesecake no vacation shots or jumping out of a plane shot once they have interviewed you the rules change include your picture on everything so they can recall you better it's very easy to insert a small picture under your signature in a computer generated letter Now, what mistakes in the resume preparation? The number one mistake is that your resume doesn't directly address the employer's needs because you have submitted the same resume that you have sent to 200 other employers. And that's so hard. Because What's so hard about customizing your resume to the job opening when you are doing it on a computer? It's not really hard. The second mistake is that the resume is confusing to read 
because it's loaded with technical jargon. Don't ask someone with a master's degree to review it. Ask your friend who flunked out of high school. If he or she can figure out what job you're applying for, you are on the right track. The third error is that it has spelling or grammatical errors. Every HR director I interviewed told me that they are surprised that they constantly get resumes with blatant, blatant grammatical errors and obvious spelling mistakes. How hard is it to use a spell or a grammar checker? They conclude that some applicants don't even read their own resumes or cover letters before they send them off. If the resume is too dull, for the applicant to read, how does he or she expect the employer to be thrilled? Now, we are going to go over how to tailor your style to the job opening after a break. Hello, this is Sarah Yusupov, Staba Manchon. Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, Wednesdays, 10 p.m. Eastern, where I will discuss about your dream job, career coaching, answering your questions regarding careers exclusively on TuneIn Satellite and the Armed Radio Global Networks. So let's learn about how to tailor your style to the job opening. If you're applying for a job as a sales manager at a used car superstore, you wouldn't use the same writing style as someone applying for a job as operations manager at a nuclear power plant. The sales manager might want to start with blaring headlines such as, you want to move 200 cars a day? I'm the one you need. The operations manager approach would be much more low-key, for example, experienced, qualified, come as a rock under pressure. If you are experienced in your profession or occupation, you will know the approach that will best please the employer. Now, let's go over what you don't need to forget to include. Okay, don't forget to include that there are some important elements that you might forget to include, but could be critical in landing your job interview. For example, computer competency. Just about any job requires knowledge of computers and computer software. These days, to say nothing of a Blackberries and MP3s or um, Android, iPhones, to be sure to tell the equipment you can use and the software with which you are comfortable. Of course, if you are certified by one of the software manufacturers such as uh, MCSE, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer, CCNA, Cisco Certified Networking Associate, CNE, a Novel Certificate uh, Netware Engineer, or a CAN, Novel Certified Network Administrator, you will want to feature these valuable credentials. Also, don't forget to include charitable work. Volunteerism is a big is big these days. So be sure to mention the habitat for humanity that you have helped build, the soup kitchens at which they you have served, the golf tournaments you have run, and the money you have collected for charity. Foreign languages. The global village is here, and it's hard to think of a company that doesn't have some business overseas. So let employers know if you speak any foreign languages. Knowledge of Japanese or Mandarin could be a job cincher. Mm -hmm. A surefire way to get an interview. So here's what a great idea when you are having trouble getting the employer to grant you first interview. Um, Roger's old friend Tim Rush taught him this one. It has four stages to it. And um, I'll be surprised if you get a stage four without getting an interview, even with the most recalcitrant HR director. Stage one, type up a brief introduction letter that says, I'm very big way. I think I can do a terrific job for you. Take it down to Kinko's at, to your local print shop and have them blow it up into a two foot by three foot poster. Wrap it up and mail it to the HR director. Stage two. Get an old shoe and mail to them with a big card and clothes that says, Now that I have got my foot in the door, I'd like an opportunity to tell you what I can do for you. One warning here. Don't do this if the recipient is Arab, Persian, or Thai. Uh, showing the bottom of your foot to these people can be very insulting. 
In that case, skip stage 2 and go to stage 3. Stage 3, buy a hammer at the 99 cent store and put it in a box with big card that says, I'd like to drive home the point that I'm the perfect person for the job. Stage 4, buy a small gardening spade and box it up with a note that says, why don't you dig my resume out from that big stack of your desk and give me a call. If that doesn't work, send a note that says, I've been trying to get my foot in your door for two weeks now. At least I, I managed to get my shoe in the door. Now, will you let me hobble in for an interview and give my shoe back? If the HR director has any sense of humor at all, he or she will admire your creativity and grant you the interview long before you get to the stage. Now, let's go over to key points to consider. The purpose of a resume is to get you a face-to-face interview. Nothing more. Leave out any information that could be discriminatory. Employers are not allowed to ask your age, sex, marital status, religion, height, weight or whether you smoke and you are not to offer that information make your resume directly relevant to the job being offered a long resume is okay as long as the important information is up front model your opening after a good attention grabbing headline in a newspaper and then expand on the story later in the resume imagine that the reader is reviewing a stack of 200 resumes what is your resume makes him or her Pick up the phone call and phone call for an interview, and follow up with a phone call within three days. Use the "I can solve your problem" approach, and triple check your spelling and grammar with today's computer software. There is no excuse for errors, and tailor your style of writing to the job opening, and be creative in your attempt to get face-to-face interview. Stage 2 of a salary negotiation is the interview. The purpose of the interview from your point of view is to get the potential employer to make an offer. Be assured that you focus on this objective. At no time during the interview should you even suggest that money in an issue. You should only start to negotiate the amount of your compensation package once you have a firm offer from the employer. The first interview is one of the scariest things about getting a new job. You are going to you are going into unknown territory, you may have only done this a few times in your life and you will be dealing with someone who does it 10 or more times a day. You are intimidated because there is a lot of reward and punishment power in play here. You could come out of this with a perfect job with fabulous compensation package. This could be something that will positively affect your life for the next 20 years. On the other side, it could end in total humiliation. You might be completely unqualified for the job, and they may laugh at your salary request. No wonder you are intimidated. Roger's golfing buddy Ted tells the story of being on a hiring panel for the local police department. A woman applied for the job who clearly had absolutely no qualifications. They were polite to her. But Ted finally asked her, could I ask you why you applied for this job when you have no experience or qualifications? The applicant rolled her eyes and said, well, sir, it's like this. When you see a gray, a gravy train going by, you just naturally want to jump on it. Now, gathering information about the company, using the internet to find job openings. The Wall Street Journal has an excellent site intended for college graduates. Do a keyword search for chemist, for example, and you get 29 job openings around the country. You get specific employers and locations, and you can click through to apply for the job online. The granddaddy of job search website is Monster. If you enter chemist at that site, you'll find 987 job openings. If sticking your head in the federal government through appeals to you, Try jobsearch.usajobs.opm.gov forward slash index dot ASP, which has 81 openings for chemists. If you want to find out what a federal job pays, find out the grade and the step and go to opm.gov. Click on general schedule and local pay tab tables 
It's written in government speak, but you should be able to figure it out. The federal government offers a massive website from the Bureau of Labor of Statistics. Getting information from this site can be thought of as taking a sip of water from a fire hose. But it's only there somewhere. You are paying for it. and Or at least you will be when you find a job and start paying taxes. So you might as well use it. Now, learning about more about the company. Learning more used to be hard work, but with the internet, it's easy. Through, thoroughly read the company's website. Find by going to Google and type in the company's name. Be sure to read the press and release section so that you are up on current events of the company. It makes you appear so informed to be able to say, didn't you open a new assembly plant in Bangladesh last month? Look the company up at the Standard & Poor's website. This is a McGraw Hill company that researches companies and sells the information to subscribers, but it gives a lot of free information about companies on its website. And then use Hovers.com to research the company. This is a Dun and Bradstreet company that sells information to subscribers, but it also offers a lot of free information on its website. Now, how do you prepare for an interview? Now, all of this information is exactly how to get to salary negotiation. But you have to know the foundation first before you even go into asking for a salary. So, preparing for interview. As is the case with anything, anything else, the more prepared you are for the interview, the more relaxed you will be and the better you will do. Preparation is the key. I remember when I did my first and last parachute jump, I was absolutely terrified when I showed up at the jump zone in the morning. But after a few hours of having them show me the equipment and jumping off higher and higher platforms, I had enough confidence to get on the plane. I was still terrified, but at least I had my fear under control. Contrast that with the time when I went scuba diving in St. Thomas, Virginia Islands. I went with a group from cruise ship who were nearly all first-timers. By law, they had to take a short class to qualify them to dive. When we arrived at the dive shop, their classroom was full, so our instructor said, Never mind, I'll teach you on the way down to the beach. He loaded us onto an open-sided bus, and as it roared around the curves to the beach, he stood in front of us holding up the equipment and yelling instructions to us. It was totally in adequate as you can imagine the dive was a nightmare most of the would-be divers panicked before they got their shoulders underwater and only a handful of us completed the dive even though we are only in shallow water preparation is the key to overcoming fear and building self-confidence it's a good idea to go on a few interviews for jobs that you don't care about just to develop some confidence this will help you get a feel for how it goes and what to expect if you are worried that the hr director will throw questions at you that you won't feel comfortable answering it's a good idea to rehearse the answers to questions that might rattle you thank you of, on your, of yourself as a nominee for the supreme court who is preparing for your grilling by senate judicial committee have your significant other play the role of host, hostile HR director and fire the tough questions at you. You'll be much better prepared for the actual interview. Remember that if the interviewer is sitting there looking at your resume, he or she is not going to ask you questions that you have already answered in writing. Try to think of questions that are not covered. Basically, I am doing mock-up interviews with each candidate that is interested. I spend time with you um, answering questions and also asking questions what the HR might ask you. So if you are interested, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, and we can discuss more in details. Um, the questions that um, you might be asked is, tell me about the challenges that you faced on this job. You are almost certain to be asked this, so prepare a story for each job you have had. Rehearse the problems and tell how you took control and came through a shining. How much do you expect to get paid? I'll help you with these questions a little later, okay? 
Would you take less? Why did you leave your former employer? Why do you want to do for us? What do you want to do for us? Have you ever refused to do something because you thought it was unethical? On this job, who did you have the most problem getting along with? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What would you do if the person who reported to you refused to follow your instructions? Why didn't you finish college? What are, your mo- what are you most proud of? May I check with your current employer? I am concerned that you don't have enough experience handling blank. Remember that your first interview will probably be by telephone. An assistant to the HR director will call you out of the blue and ask you some qualifying questions. Then objective at this stage is to narrow the list of applicants. So he or she will be looking for issues that could in a- disqualify you. Your objective is to keep your resume in the stack of potential hires and move to the next level, which is the first face-to-face interview. Stay focused on that with direct appeals. And when can I come to see you? Or what can I have to do to get an interview? That's what you ask at the end when they ask you, do you have any questions? Um, What is interviewer trying to find out? Interviewers want to learn three things about you. That you can solve their problems by handling the opening they have to fill. Your strategy should be to find out all you can about the specific job opening and what you would be doing for the company. Tailor your approach to that opportunity, but also leave open the possibility that they will love you so much that they will find another place for you in the company if the current opening is filled. The next thing is... Uh, they want to know is that you have leadership skills and can inspire and motivate people to work harder and accomplish more. Your strategy should be to tell a colorful story about the time you took over in an emergency and became the company hero with your initiative, drive, creativity, and daring leadership skills. And the third thing they want to know is you will fit in with your corporate culture. Your strategy should be to talk about the company's softball team that you captained. Be sure that you treat everyone you meet at the new company as if he or she is the most important person you will meet that day. You can write rough rough shots over a personal secretary and ingratiate yourself with the interviewer. They compare notes after you leave. You know, right? Now, um... How to stand out at an interview when there are a lot of applicants. Most applicants will dutifully answer all the questions that they are asked and hope they get a job offer. This is not a good negotiating strategy. You want to come across as a highly desirable applicant who will be choosing from myriad of offers. As I'll explain later, negotiating um, options give you a power in negotiation. A good way to project that you have options is to take some time at the end of the interview to see if the employer can offer you what you expect. After the interviewer has asked you her questions, you ask your questions. And they might include who are your major competitors. You can ask that. And why are you better than them? What is your corporate mission statement? Do you try to promote from within? Where do you think this company will be five years from now? Are you prepared to make an offer today? Where will I hear from you? Asking questions project that you are not going to jump at the first job offered offered you and that you have several options, which gives you the power in the subsequent salary negotiation. So basically, it's like they interview you, but you also should interview them. And that way, they know that they are not actually looking for somebody who is just going to jump in and say, yes, I need a job. Now, you need to express your skills as benefits to the employer. Salespeople know the difference between features of the product they are selling and the benefits of owning the product. These roofing tiles are made of concrete. Is a feature. So you will never catch fire, blow away, or, sw- or wear out are the benefits. In an employment interview... I am an experienced negotiator. At my last job at the leasing company, I bought more than 8,000 cars a year. Is a feature. I saved the company more than $122,000 last year over 
what they were paying for the course before they hired me is a benefit. So how to keep the interview process moving forward? Be sure that you send the interviewers a handwritten thank you note. That's what makes you stand out from all the other people he or she interviewed that day. Don't be tempted to be to type a formal letter because a handwritten note is much more powerful. Be sure to personalize it with a comment about something that happened during the interview. The perfect vehicle is a postcard that has your picture on it. Your picture reminds the interviewer of who you are and because it's not in an envelope, there is no danger that secretary will open the envelope and discard the letter. Sending a thank you note in this way indicates that you are a caring people person. Because nearly all HR directors are caring people persons, they will like you for it. It also shows how organized you are and how much you would like to work with them. Send a thank you card to everyone with whom you came in contact at the company, not just the people you, who you feel could help you hire, could help or hire you. Follow up your handwritten note with a brief email. Having your email address at hand makes it much easier for the interviewer to reply to you. Um, we'll take a short break and I'll be right back. Found a place to celebrate? But wait, you are missing a sweet table. desserts and a menu full of items of your choice. Call 347-265-5063. You can have a sweet table as if you are a celebrity. Quality worth every penny. Order from New York Artisan Bakery. Want to win your party? Call 347-265-5063. So, let's discuss about handling the issue of money. This is the most delicate issue to be raised in a negotiation. Employers will try to raise this issue early in the process because they don't want to waste time on applicants they can't afford. Also, they want to make your past earnings a big issue because they think it is it will lower your salary expectations. You want to delay the discussion of money as long as you possibly can until they are convinced that you are the person they need. That way, you will get a better offer. So here are some tips on how to handle this sensitive issue. What to say when asked, what are you getting paid now? Try not to answer this question until they are drooling to get you on board. But if forced to answer, be sure that you include all your benefits, not just your salary. Your response should be, I feel that my total package is worth about $80,000 a year. Your way of calculating that would include base salary, bonuses, both actual and potential, vacation pay, stock options, travel allowances, health plans, life insurance, access to company health club, employee discounts, the benefits of not having a long commute to work, reimbursement for meals, frequent flyer points collected, hotel frequent guest points collected, reimbursement for tuition, training gifts given by company beyond that of learning about the company, retirement plans for 1k contributions, free cappuccino machine in the lunchroom, that's two cups a day which would be $3 each at Starbucks for 250 working days in a year. That's $1,500 right there. As you can see, there is a huge difference between your base salary and your total compensation package. If you are to respond to their question about current earnings by just giving them your base salary, you would be vastly underrating yourself. So what to do if you get a low offer for a job? Write them a sincere counteroffer letter, or better yet, call and ask for an appointment to discuss counteroffer. Negotiations always work better face to face for several reasons. You can read the body language better to face to face face to face. You can communicate your seriousness better. You can shake hands and reach an agreement on the spot. If you are reduced to writing a letter, make these pointy points 
you sincerely admire the company, see great opportunity there and want to work for them, the only stumbling block is the compensation. Restate all the great things you could do in the position. Mention that you have another offer available to you that pays more, but you really want to go with this company. Projecting that you have options given gives you power. It also makes it easier for the HR director to sell his or her boss on paying you more. Ask for more than you expect to get so they can have a win with you. Imply some flexibility to encourage them to negotiate with you. Perhaps you could say, I really feel that I'm well worth $100,000. I might take a little less. Support your requested amount with the research that justifies it. List the items on which you have reached agreement. It reminds the HR director of all the work he's gone through to get this far. He's then more likely to be flexible because he subconsciously wants to recoup the time already invested. Once you have agreed on a package, ask for it in writing. Is it appropriate to ask for the offer in writing? Yes, by all means. Your new employer wants to eliminate any misunderstanding just as much as you do. Get it in writing and be sure that the letter includes all the details. If it's high-level position, try to get it signed by an officer of the company. So what the interviewer is looking for, what impresses an HR director, what is he or she is looking for in an applicant. If she has several applicants with similar credentials, what would make her pick you? So here are eight key issues that gives you the edge over other applicants. Credentials, reward power, punishment power, consistency, character, charisma, expertise power, information power. So let's start with details. Credentials. In the United States, we are influenced by titles, not as much as in Germany or Switzerland. But we are high on the list of countries where titles give status. If you have had titles in high school, college, and previous employment, be sure to mention them. Because titles build your credentials. Anything you can do to stress your credentials is valuable. This might include high school and college degrees, include any leadership roles that you took in campus activities, scholastic achievements, titles in previous jobs. Have you been a vice president, a sales manager, or a group leader on a project? Recognition by industry peers. Have you been president of your industry association, on the board of directors, or on a committee? Have you received any reward from your industry association such as a member of the year? Also, specific experience gives you magic credentials. Have you put out oil fires in Kuwait or built bridges in Brazil? Then it's a reward power. What can you tell the interview that emphasizes the problem that you solve for him and the money you can make for him? This is a big one and you need to pour it on. The belief that you can solve problem problems and build his business is what builds the excitement to get you on the payroll. Be specific about how much money your accomplishments made for your previous employer. Punishment power. This is much harder to do without causing offense, but if there is a way that you can convince them of the problems that they could get into if they don't hire you, it's a powerful point to make. Perhaps you can say something such, this type of work is very complicated, it takes a lot of skill to get it right, and the downside of not doing it well is so enormous. Consistency. Trust is a product of consistency. If you want the employer to trust you, which is essential, you must project consistency. For example, it's okay to have made several job moves as long as each one was not was to better yourself or gain the experience you would need to build a career. However, if you flopped around from one job to another without any sense of purpose, that's bad. HR directors love to hear that you have had a passion for your field ever since grade school ever since grade school they don't like students who took liberal arts courses because they couldn't decide what to do with their lives and have switched from job to job trying to find something that interested them and then character the interviewer will no doubt be looking for indications of high moral character be careful that you don't drop your standards just to please if the interviewer asks you if you could quit your present job and start right away your response should be, I think that my present employer would agree to that. But if not, I would feel obligated to give them two weeks notice. You have been so good to me. Be careful that you are not in any way implying that you could bring company secrets with you or help them recruit your present company's employees. 
charisma. Projecting charisma makes a big difference. I cover this、um, later. But here are some brief tips. Handshake. This is important because if it's first physical contact with the interviewer, ask a good friend or a coach、uh, to coach you on improving your handshake. Shake hands and ask him or her to rate your handshake on a scale of 1 to 10. Then ask what it would take to get it to 10. If you're a gripper, a bumper, or a wet fish, you need to work on your handshake. Eye contact. As you shake hands, notice the color of the interviewer's eyes and silently count to three, holding off his or her gaze for a little longer than you your otherwise could make a big impression. Push out a warm thought as you shake the interviewer's hand and look deeply into his or her eyes. Push out a warm, positive thought, such as, I'm really, really glad that I met you. This is going to be the start of a long friendship. Smile as you shake hands and again as you sit down to talk. You may be feeling very nervous, but it won't show if you are wearing a big smile. Charisma is very hard to explain. We know it when we see it, but we have trouble explaining it. When you are having trouble understanding something, it helps to think of the opposite. What characteristics would you ascribe to the least charismatic person on earth? With whom would you list? Like to spend the rest of your life in, on a desert island. I think it would be a person who is totally self centered, someone who only thinks of him or herself. Take John Paul Getty, for example, when he was a rich man in the world. Many people wanted to own what he owned, but nobody wanted to be who he was. Aristotle Onassis had the greatest difficulty in doing business with him until, as he explains in his autobiography, he accepted that anything Getty would do would be totally self serving. If the opposite of charisma is being self centered, it becomes clear that charisma is the ability to project that you care about everyone with whom you come in contact. You don't have to be Mother Teresa caring about every poor person on the planet. Or a Martin Luther King caring about everyone suffering from、uh, racial injustice, but you do need to care about everyone you meet. Dale Carnegie had some great advice in, his regard, in this regard. He said, Treat everyone you meet as if they are the most important person you'll meet that day. That's well said, isn't it? Not the most important person you'll ever meet, or even the most important person you will meet that week. That would be over the top. Treat everyone you meet as if they were the most important person you will meet that day. You can't get away with treating the HR director with respect while treating the secretary as a servant. Expertise power. This is more important than ever in today's high tech world, isn't it? If you have an expertise that this company needs, you develop a great deal of power over it. There's a famous story about IBM when it had a very strict dress code. Everyone wore gray suits and white buttons down collar shirts. An executive was vis- visiting a regional office and rode up to the elevator with its scruffy looking men wearing sandals, blue jeans, and a t shirt. He was horrified and berated the manager for not enforcing the dress code for visitors. The manager told him that the man wasn't a visitor, he was an employee. Not anymore, said the executive. Fire him. They fired him. But quickly had to rehire him, sandals and all, when they realized that he was, had a programming expertise nobody else had. Be sure that you are projecting expertise during the interview. That's why it's so important to tell stories to, of, the, of the challenges that you faced on previous assignments and how you overcame those challenges. Then, information power. Human beings have the tremendous natural curiosity that may have killed the cat, but curiosity made us masters of the universe. We can't stand not knowing. You can put a cow in a field and it will stay in that field all its life, never wondering what's on the other side of that hill. But humans are going to spend billions of dollars to fly to Mars because we have to know if there is microscopic life there or not. HR directors love to hear inside secrets of how things are. At other companies. You mustn't give away any company secrets, of course, but they love to hear stories of the corporate executives you have met and the, and the personnel activities you attended.
You are tuning in to Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. I am aired every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. In this show, I talk about career advancement, resume revamps, interview expectations, how to stand out from the crowd, how to brand yourself, and skills you need to become a CEO. All of this is on Armed Radio on my show, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, exclusively on TuneIn Satellite and the Armed Radio Network. Now, problem issues. What to do if your previous employer won't give a good reference? First, you should confirm your suspicions. If your previous company really bad-mouthing you or has your paranoia overwhelmed you, to find out, have a friend call the old employee as if he or she were a personnel clerk for a new employer. Just have him or her call the personnel department and see how much information the old employer will give out. Your friend should keep asking questions until the personnel department shuts him or her up. We we'll live in such a litigious age that a few employers will give out negative information. They will limit themselves to confirming the dates worked and I will possibly respond negatively. If asked the question, would you rehire? They will most never confirm earnings because they won't they don't know their current employees nosing around. When I was a personal director, I would only give out dates of employment and a terse no comment to the would you rehire question. Once I was so upset with an employee that had unjustly sued us that I asked to return the call to be sure that I wasn't talking to an attorney and then said I have a policy that if I can't say anything nice about someone, I won't say anything at all. That's a nice day as I ever got. Remember that if you are claiming unemployment insurance, the only employer has a vested interest in getting you off of its state claim list. So what to do if you've been unemployed for a long time? So here are some suggestions to help handle the sensitive situation. You can say things like that, the following, okay? I've been doing some consulting work, being self-employed appealed to me for a while, but now I realize that I can't reach my full potential unless I'm with a big company. Or you can say, I love to do some traveling that was important to me, but I have got it out of my system now. Or you can say, I left my last job a year ago because I couldn't achieve my full potential and I've treated my job search as a full-time job. I've had several offers, but I am prepared to wait until I find the perfect opportunity. You can also say, we felt that it was important for one of us to stay home until our child went into kindergarten. And you can say also, my father was ill and I needed to be with him. Now, don't lie, of course, but realize that taking a year off from work makes a lot sense to some people. Don't think of it as something to be ashamed of. Taking a year off from work is something about which most Americans dream. I had a candidate once told me that she had a surgery to go to and she had to be bedridden for a while. So that is a good excuse to say why she has a gap in her resume. Now, what to do if you were fired from your last job? Now, there is no need to lie yourself up in a knot over this issue. Everyone on the planet has been fired from a job at one time or another. The interviewer will be far more interested in why you were fired from the job. Let's take a look at some acceptable reasons for being fired. They downsized and I didn't have the seniority to take the cut. That's a good, that's a good, um, something you can say. Or you can say they closed at that location and I was not willing to move. They outsourced my my job to India. And now here are some unacceptable reasons for being fired. They called me stealing. I sued them for poor employment practices and I lost. My boss was an idiot and and wouldn't listen to me. Remember that they will probably only find out if you were fired if you tell them. The vast majority of previous employers will only verify the dates worked. So, 
Take this into consideration. Don't be too concerned what your former employer will give you a bad reference. Employers are so scared of lawsuits these days that they are not going to go out on a limb and find out what kind of references the previous employer will give you by having a friend call for a reference. And if you have been unemployed for a while, come up with a good reason for your sabbatical. And next week, I'm going to talk about more in details about how to respond to an offer and then about salary negotiation. So I really hope to hear from you. If you have any questions, you can text me on Messenger. Uh, Let's talk careers with Sarah. And we can just chit-chat a little bit about your goals and about any questions that you have. And I will be gladly even share them on my show. I am running out of time, so that will be another topic we'll discuss in my show perhaps next Wednesday. And I would like to say thank you for those who are listening to me. Thank you so much for uh, doing your homework, you know, by listening to experts like me about uh, uh, jobs, about resumes, and about um, how to be happy in your in a work environment. So I really want to say thank you again. So I'm going to see you next Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Armed Radio. Let's talk careers with Sarah. You are tuning in on Armed Radio and Let's Talk Careers with Sarah every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. I talk about careers and job hunting. If you would like to ask a question or would like to hear about previous shows that you have missed, you can find me on Facebook at Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. You can learn about jobs, tips, and advice on my page. If you have a career-related question, you can just message me on Facebook.